Welcome to the exciting finale of History 2112, U.S. History 2. This is the final week of the course. Uh, congratulations on surviving the class, and hopefully you are all going to do well this semester. Uh, with any luck, maybe I'll see a couple of you in one of my world history courses. This lecture is going to be relatively short, and it's just kind of a summation of what's going on in the 1970s and the 1980s. And it's called the triumph of the right because during the 1970s and the 1980s, the United States kind of takes this hard right turn politically and Republican tendencies start to take over. And it really kind of goes back to Richard Nixon, who in 1968, he's going to campaign for the presidency based on this idea of bringing America together and ending the war in Vietnam. Uh, he's also helped with the entire snafu or issue of 1968, Lyndon Johnson, all the assassinations, the craziness that is the Democratic National Convention. We also know from the Vietnam War lecture that Richard Nixon doesn't entirely keep his promise in Vietnam and he creates his own issues. But that's gonna happen a little bit further down the road. Um, Richard Nixon, his plan to bring the country together, if you will, was to make the government more efficient. Uh, he wanted to shift the, burgeon, the burden of financing social programs from the federal government to the state government. And he wanted to cap the amount of welfare payments that was paid out per year at $2.5 billion. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but when you consider all of the programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and anything else that was out there, that $2.5 billion would go very quickly. Uh, some other things he wanted to do was just kind of slow the overall amount of federal spending and he wanted to raise interest rates as well. And a big reason for that was to try and counteract and control the government spending that was happening because of the cost of the Vietnam War. Vietnam War was still going on strong in 1968. In fact, 1968 was the year that the United States had its largest involvement in Vietnam. So a good portion of the federal budget was going to the war effort in 1969, 1970. Richard Nixon appoints as his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, who is the guy on the bottom right. He was a survivor of World War II from Germany and Nixon is going to ask Henry Kissinger to negotiate with the Soviet Union as well as China. And Richard Nixon is going to work with the, United, with the Soviet Union, the USSR, to end the nuclear arms race. Nixon is going to work with Kissinger to give the Soviet Union food and technologies. In 1972, Nixon's actually going to go to China and becomes the first president to visit communist China. And as you know from the Vietnam War lecture, Nixon and Kissinger are going to secretly negotiate with North Vietnam on how to reach a ceasefire. That process starts in 1969 and finally the truce is agreed to in 1972 and the fighting between North Vietnam and the United States stops by the end of March 1973. Despite all of that, what Richard Nixon is best known for is the Watergate scandal. And this is a huge, confusing mess. Um, it all goes back to 1971 when Richard Nixon, he's going to create this group known as the Plumbers. And the, they're called the plumbers because their job is to stop leaks. What leaks are they worried about? 
people within the president's administration leaking information to the press. The very first target of the plumbers is this guy named Daniel Ellsberg. He released the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post and the New York Times. And the Pentagon Papers was this internal critical study of America's Vietnam policy. And the Pentagon Papers basically said that the United States government knew from the beginning they could never win a war in Vietnam. Well, the plumbers went to the psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg, broke into his doctor's office, tried to get his personal records so that they could discredit Daniel Ellsberg. At almost the same time this is happening, the then Attorney General John Mitchell is going to resign from the government to become the head of CREEP. And I don't know of any acronym in the history of America that is better than this. CREEP stood for the Committee to Re-elect the President. Just remember the name CREEP. It's going to fit so well here during the story. Now, CREEP's job was to raise money for the re-election campaign of Richard Nixon. And Creep was going to raise millions of dollars in illegal campaign contributions. And Creep is going to be the funding source for the plumbers. One of Nixon's advisors, a guy named G. Gordon Liddy, is going to suggest to Nixon to have the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee bugged so that Creep would know what the Democratic Party was planning and what the Democratic Party was saying about Richard Nixon. Now, there's two different reasons for that. One is because G. Gordon Liddy thought this would give Creep a one-up in advantage in the re-election campaign. But the other reason was Richard Nixon was extremely, extremely uh, nervous and he thought everybody was out to get him and he was very, very untrusting of just about everyone. So when we get to June 17th of 1972, five men are arrested and caught breaking into the Watergate Hotel. Why the Watergate Hotel? Because that's where the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee was. Well, it turns out of the five people, Four were anti-Castro Cubans who worked for the CIA, and the fifth was a man named James McCord. Why is James McCord important? Because he was an employee of CREEP, the committee to re-elect the president. Now, after the arrest of the burglars, Nixon is going to suggest that CREEP should pay off the burglars to keep them quiet. Basically, Nixon says, hey, former Attorney General Mitchell, why don't you use some of my re-election campaign money to pay off these guys so that they keep it secret that I'm involved in this? This hush money was supposed to keep any connection between Creep, Nixon, and the plumbers quiet. If that's not bad enough, Nixon is going to attempt to get the FBI to stop the investigation over the, the break-in, and Nixon is going to order his staff members to lie under oath to protect him. Well, January 1973, James McCord is going to write a letter and he is going to admit that the White House ordered the Watergate break-in. As a result of this letter, uh, there's a Senate committee formed to investigate what's going on, and this special prosecutor named Archibald Cox is going to be appointed to conduct the investigation. While the investigation is being done, it becomes known that Richard Nixon secretly records every conversation that happens in the Oval Office. And Archibald Cox is going to ask Richard Nixon for a copy of these recordings. Richard Nixon does not give 
the recordings to Archibald Cox, but what he does is release a heavily edited transcript. And Archibald Cox says that's not good enough, and he demands again a copy of the, the recordings. Nixon's going to order the new Attorney General, a guy named Elliot Richardson, to fire Archibald Cox. Attorney General Richardson refuses to do this because he knows it's wrong and resigns. Richard Nixon then asks Assistant Attorney General William Ruckelshaus to fire Crocs, Cox. Uh, Ruckelshaus is going to resign and refuse to fire Cox as well. Finally, the third person in line, Solicitor General Robert Bork, does the firing and Cox is going to be fired after all. Now this becomes known as the Saturday Night Massacre and when Nixon goes through all this trouble to force the firing of Special Prosecutor Cox, everybody pretty much knew Nixon was guilty. Now eventually there's a lawsuit, Nixon versus, or I'm sorry, it's the United States versus Nixon, where the US government sues the president in the Supreme Court, forcing Nixon to turn over the recordings. When the recordings are turned over, number one, there's this mysterious 17 and a half minute period in one conversation where the recording has been erased. And second of all, it becomes very evident very quickly that Nixon was the mastermind behind Creep, the Watergate break-in, and the plumbers. Nixon is told that he has the support of fewer than 15 senators in the US Senate, and that if a impeachment proceeding is begun, Richard Nixon will be impeached and removed from office. Left with basically no other choice, Richard Nixon tenders his resignation on August 9th, 1974, and becomes the only president ever to resign from office. After Nixon, on um, October 6, 1973, right at the end of Nixon's presidency, Egypt and Syria attack Israel in what's known as the Yom Kippur War. This is going to have drastic events, or effects, I should say, for Gerald Ford, who is the next president, and Jimmy Carter, who is the president after that. Uh, this attack becomes known as the Yom Kippur War. It only lasts about two weeks. But as a result of this, um, the OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, is created. And because the United States gave aid to Israel, OPEC is going to cut oil production as a result. Um, because OPEC cuts oil production and refuses to sell oil to any country that helped Israel, uh, there's a worldwide gas shortage and a worldwide oil, uh, oil shortage. To give you an idea of how bad oil prices rose, in 1973, oil went for $3 per barrel, which is the equivalent of $18 today. By 1979, oil had gone up to $30 a barrel, which was the equivalent of $179 today. It's hard to believe going from $18 to almost $200. Wages ended up falling, prices increased, the money supply tightened, interest rates were regularly over 20%. Uh, there's high employment, high interest rates, high inflation, tight money. Uh, this is a, an event that in economic theory is not supposed to happen, yet here we are in the middle of the 1970s with the worst case scenario. And this is given a special name called stagflation. 
When Gerald Ford becomes president in 1974, one of his first acts is to pardon Richard Nixon, and this pardoning happens on September 8th of 1974. In the 1976 presidential election, Gerald Ford has honestly shot himself in the foot because nobody was happy with the pardoning of Richard Nixon. Gerald Ford says the entire point behind it was to try and move the country on, but a lot of people thought that that um, Richard Nixon was being covered for. So um, Gerald Ford does not get reelected president, or I should say elected in the first place because he never was elected president. Jimmy Carter, um, full disclosure, is one of my favorite presidents ever after studying him. Um, so I just want to you know, get that out there. Um, <clears throat> Jimmy Carter, he was, former, he was a governor of Georgia. He was a former US Navy uh, nuclear submarine engineer, um, also known for being a peanut farmer from Plains, Georgia. Um, he has really big ambitions, really big goals. He creates the Department of Education. He creates the Department of Energy. Uh, he's seen as an outsider. He's very nice and honest. But to be quite honest, um, a lot of his ideas were about 20 years too early. And he was the big idea thinker that just honestly wasn't correct for the time period. Um, when it came to social ideas he was great but he wasn't good with economics um, and he's best known for what's called the crisis of confidence speech which is something you have to watch for this week uh, basically in the crisis of confidence speech um, he is going to say look america has trouble we are failing at our our mission and we need to do something about this in many ways in the crisis of confidence speech this is my opinion of course Richard or, um, Jimmy Carter is taking kind of this Sunday school approach and trying to preach to you much like a Sunday school teacher would try to teach you. President Ford is going to be the one who actually ends the U.S. involvement in Vietnam when North Vietnam attacks South Vietnam again in 1974. Richard, or I'm sorry, President Ford is going to be the one who says, no, 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 we're not going to help you. Jimmy Carter is going to make arrangements to give the Panama Canal back to Panama. Um, the treaty is signed, and I believe it's 1979, and the handover happens in the early 2000s. Probably the biggest pieces of news that happened during this time period, though, uh, in the Camp David Peace Accords, President Carter is going to bring the leaders of Israel and Egypt together to work out a long-lasting peace treaty, and Israel and Egypt are going to recognize each other officially as as um, form. They're going to you know create formal relations and and they're going to agree to be partners and everything else. Unfortunately, that is going to be overshadowed by the Iranian Revolution of 1979. The Shah of Iran is going to get sick. He's going to come to the United States for medical treatment. And while he's out of the country, um, there's going to be this Islamic revolution that happens. And the U.S. Embassy is going to be overrun and seized. 58 hostages are going to be taken captive. Um, Jimmy Carter is going to order a rescue attempt, but this rescue attempt is going to fail and eight people are going to die as a result. So we have the 1980 election and Jimmy Carter is going to face the former governor of California and the former Hollywood actor Ronald Reagan. Uh, this is a very divisive election. Uh, Carter is going to claim that Reagan is a warmonger because Reagan is very um, anti-communist. Reagan's going to claim that Carter ruined the economy. And in the end, Reagan's going to win pretty big. 489 electoral college votes to 49. Reagan gets about 52% of the popular vote. And almost like insult to injury, as soon as Ronald Reagan wins the presidency, Iran is going to let 
the 58 hostages go. So what is Reagan all about? Well, he's about what's called supply side economics and Reaganomics. Uh, he wants to lower taxes, he wants to lower income tax rates, and he wants to lower social program spending. It's also this period of government deregulation. Uh, for example, uh, the go government lands are going to be open for coal production and timber production. A relaxed environmental regulation policy is going to um, stop the fuel efficiency drive in the auto industry. And just for good measure, Ronald Reagan is going to have the retirement age raised. And it's going to be come a little bit more difficult to get Social Security. Now, what is this Reaganomics you've heard about? Uh, well, it comes out of this recession that begins in 1981. Um, unemployment starts to rise. And Reagan comes up with this idea, uh, this theory, that if the government reduces taxes, and these tax cuts are going to be mostly towards businesses, that businesses will keep more of their money and that increase in money will trickle down eventually to the everyday worker. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Usually the businesses only trickled it down to the uh, corporate stockholders. And while it is true that the everyday worker saw a slight bump in pay, the wealthy class, the upper class, became much, much more wealthy. In fact, under Reaganomics, the bottom 20% of the American population actually got poorer. By 1986, though, uh, the deficit peaked at $221 billion, and it began to decline after that. Um, in fact, the deficit was cut in half by 1989. During the 1980s, the value of the dollar increased, which is something that hadn't happened in quite a while. And the amount of overall debt started to decrease. That's personal debt and public debt. Inflation rates are going to fall from 20% to about 4%. Oil prices start to drop. And the top tax rate drops from 70% down to 20%. So when I say tax cuts, the tax cuts are huge. We also get the end of the Cold War right around Reagan's second term in office. Officially, the Cold War ends in 1991, but by 1986, maybe 1987, we're well on our way to the end of the Cold War. Now, Reagan, he was very, very conservative, and he strongly believed that the Soviet Union was the mortal enemy of the United States. And he believed the only way to, the, to defeat the Soviet Union was to outspend them. So he's going to abandon this idea of detente, and he is going to increase military spending to huge, huge numbers that continue today. He's also going to order the government to research the Star Wars initiative or the Strategic Defense Initiative as it was officially known. What Star Wars was supposed to do, it was going to be this series of, of satellite platforms that orbited the Earth equipped with laser beams that could fire on nuclear missiles when the Soviet Union launched them. Um, str the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars, never came online. It was decided it was too expensive, plus the fall of the Soviet Union is going to reduce the need for it. Elsewhere, um, in Central America, there are these US-backed dictators who are fighting against these leftist socialist rebels, um, nearly communist. In some cases, they were communist rebels. 
And this is going to lead to an event called the Iran-Contra Affair. Um, the Congress makes it illegal to help the dictators. So everything has to be done hush-hush under, under the table. Uh, the United States is going to trade arms with Iran because Iran was fighting a war with Iraq. And in exchange for selling weapons to Iran, Iran agreed to help get seven or eight hostages that were being held in the country of Lebanon free. The money from those arms sales that the US government got under the table was then fund, uh, funneled to Central America where these US backed dictators known as the Contras were going to use the money the United States gave them to fight against these rebels known as the Sandinistas. Uh, this was a big no-no and when the news of this deal broke out, both the selling of guns to Iran and the funneling of money to the Contras, um, it wasn't good news. It turns out that the US government was breaking the law. Um, they were trying to cover it up and some people said that Ronald Reagan knew what was happening. Well, in the end, several people, including Colonel Oliver North, take the fall, and none of the situation ever gets officially tied to Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan's popularity does drop, but he stays out of trouble somehow. Finally, um, in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev becomes the leader of the Soviet Union, and he is open to the idea of allowing capitalism in. And this process known as perestroika is going to allow private businesses to develop within the Soviet Union. At the same time, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev the leader of the Soviet Union is willing to allow political openness as well. And that political openness is known as glasnost. Well, in the end, Gorbachev and Reagan are going to meet a total of four times. Uh, they're going to agree to set some of their differences aside. And while the meeting between Gorbachev and Reagan does not expressly end the Cold War, it goes a long way towards defrosting it until by 1989 the Berlin Wall is coming down in 1991 the Soviet Union is going to fall apart and by the way Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev become lifelong friends and Gorbachev was present and a speaker at the funeral of President Reagan now some end of course reminders for you. First of all, for this week, you do have your last discussion, you have your last quiz, you also have your last reflection paper, and then that SLO about 1968 as well. All four of those assignments, and I'm terribly sorry for them to be due right at the end of the semester, are they have to be turned in by May 3rd. Don't wait till the last minute. You're probably gonna watch this last minute, which means it's too late for the warning. But for those of you who watch this early, as soon as it's posted, please, 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 please don't wait till the last minute. Your final exam, it's gonna be available from Tuesday, May 4th until Monday, May 10th. Monday, May 10th is the absolute latest you can do it. And I have to have all of your final grades in by, I think it is May 12th. So I'm going to be working as quick as I can to get those final grades in for you guys. As always, if you have any questions, please email. You can use Blackboard, you can use your, your school email address. I'll answer you the best I can. And I, if you have any questions on how to study for the final, the number one thing I can suggest that you do is go back and look at my PowerPoints again go back and watch my videos again because any and all questions I give you are going to be from the information that I have provided you. Last thing I want to say, it's been a pleasure. 
I hope that this class was insightful. I hope I did an okay job of giving you the information and running the class. There is a class um, survey. I'm not sure if it's for this class or not because they don't tell us which classes it's for. But if there is a survey for this class, please fill it out. Let me know what I can do better for future classes. Let me know what worked, what didn't work. The only way I can improve how I run this class is to see what you, the students, have to say. Hopefully, once again, I see some of you again in the future. But if not, good luck. And it has been a pleasure. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye.